So the session we're moving into now is on uh, Catholic protection, and we've got two speakers. Our first speaker is Jim Preston, who is the Managing Director of Corrosion Prevention Limited and a consultant for Corrosion Control Association Associates Limited, both specialist consulting organisations providing corrosion investigations, um, assessments, cathodic protection design to, and technical services. He has worked in the fields of um, structural concrete repairs and cathodic protection for over 25 years, including 15 years for contracting organisations and latterly over the last 10 years as a consultant. Jim has experience in all types of commercially available systems for um, cathodic protection of concrete. He's also a chartered engineer, a fellow of the Institute um, of the UK Institute of Corrosion and an honorary member of the UK Society of Environmental Engineers. Jim is presently the chair of the Corrosion Prevention Association in the UK, the trade body who is responsible for promoting awareness of corrosion protection solutions and ensuring industry best practice. You could please welcome him now. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, firstly, thanks for the invitation to speak at your symposium. Uh, it's been a, a wonderful two days of presentations so far. I, I think the, the presentations today have been, been really fantastic. And I hope that uh, I can add to the body of knowledge that we've been looking at over the last couple of days. Um, and if nothing else, leave a few talking points that we can maybe talk about uh, at the end of the day. Warren started uh, yesterday morning by, by saying that he was coming out to uh, open the batting. And that just got me thinking, if, if, if he's an Aussie coming out to open the batting, then, then maybe that makes him David Warner. And I thought, well, I'm coming out to bat at number nine, um, and I'm an Englishman. Uh, uh, so that must make me Stuart Broad, I think. Did, did someone just hiss, then? <laughs> Okay, um, back to the presentation. Cathodic protection, is there anything still to learn? It's a rhetorical question. Yes, there, there's lots of things. We can always learn things. Um, if the answer's no, then we're in for a kind of embarrassing 50 minutes, aren't we? Um, the paper was, was jointly present, is jointly prepared by myself and my co-authors, Ian Spring, in principally got involved with looking at the galvanic anode calculations that we're going to look at towards the end of the of the presentation, uh, and also by Brian Wyatt. Brian sends his, his best regards to those that, um, that know him, sends his apologies for not being able to be with us. Um, and Brian's sort of helped out a, bit, a few sort of choice conclusions to the paper to make it a bit more, give it a bit more bite, hopefully give us a few more talking points at the end of the day. The paper's really in, in three parts. Uh, we're looking at learning from experience, um, and we can go back, we've got sort of 25 years of experience to go back and look over. I'm, I'm going to talk just briefly about cathodic protection of high strength steels because that's becoming more prevalent. We've been asked to look at that more and more and it's something that I found really that the, the guidance perhaps isn't there for. And then the, thir the third thread of the, the, the paper is looking at galvanic anodes. And when I sort of sat down in my office and I put together the different threads of things I thought I'd like to talk about, I hadn't quite realised, perhaps on this last topic, quite what interest there was uh, out there in the industry in general in, 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 in talking about galvanic anodes and, and what we're doing with them in terms of protecting concrete structures. So, history. Um, George Santiago, Italian philosopher, wrote in 1906, those who cannot remember the past are doomed to repeat. When he wrote that, I don't think he had the Midland Links motorway viaducts in mind necessarily. <laughs> m maybe he did. Um, but anyway, we, we can learn from what we've done in the past. Uh, our experience started in 1989 on the Midland Links motorway viaducts. That's why I got my introduction to cathodic protection. Um, the most relevant thing about that is that that is one year before John's experience on his slide. He had 1990 because we just got in there first with the first contract. Uh, at the same time, we were doing large contracts in the Middle East using titanium mesh, spray concrete overlay. Uh, Mina Zayed in Abu Dhabi was the first big project, about 20,000 square metres. 
and in the last 25 years, it's become globally used as a, as a, as a technique to stop corrosion of reinforcement. Uh, in the 1990s, this term cathodic prevention came about. We really mean cathodic protection of new structures. Unfortunately, the term's got stuck into standards now and has become sort of uh, everyday parlance. Uh, but massive contracts have been undertaken. Hundreds and hundreds of, of thousands of square meters worldwide have been undertaken using anode ribbons cast into new concrete. Since the 2000s, we've been putting cathodic protection on steel frame buildings. Uh, we've been using galvanic anodes to enhance patch repairs, prevent incipient anodes. Uh, and latterly, we've been using galvanic anodes globally to provide protection on structures. And throughout that time, throughout the development of impressed current cathodic protection in particular, there's been a constant <coughs> development in power supplies and monitoring equipment. And we'll, we'll have a little look at that as part of the presentation. So, so now we've got a, a technique which is, is widely documented. There's lots of guidance documents. There's Concrete Society Report, Best Practice Guidance on Cathodic Protection of Reinforced Concrete. Um, one part of the Australian Standard on Cathodic Protection of Metals covers steel in concrete. There's a NAE standard on steel in concrete. There's an ISO standard adopted by the Europeans on steel and concrete. All saying pretty much the same thing, all very similar criteria in terms of potential decay and absolute criteria. Not a great deal of difference in the guidance that's out there. So what can we learn that's maybe not in these, in these standards? I, I'm just going to start by looking at one material, and, and I'm going to go back to the Midland links here. Uh, we, we started using conductive coatings uh, as the first type of anode on the Midland links. And over the last 25 years, some of those systems are actually working very well, and they're still in very good condition. So by an example, this, this photo was taken a couple of months ago in June this year. This system was installed in the early 1990s. It used the DAC 85 system. Uh, the coating itself is actually in very good condition. It's well adhered. Water runs down the front face of the beams. They run to the joint. All these, all these structures get saturated. That's, that's what's caused the problem to start with. But the systems work well according to the operator of the system. And we can compare that to another system installed about the same time. That's what it looks like today. But in truth, it's looked like that from probably five years after it was installed. Uh, it's, it's subject to a similar exposure. And the fundamental difference is simply that one product is better than the other product. Um, subsequently, there's a NACE standard developed to tell us how we can test conductive coatings. It was a little after the, the horse had bolted because we stopped using conductive coatings in the Midland links. 1,200 structures to go at. Two products were approved initially. All the contractors saw an opportunity to try and bring in new products, and, and Me Too products came to the market. They didn't go through a rigorous test regime, uh, and failures happened. A and I see a parallel to what's happening today with galvanic anodes. We've got a few products out there which have been out there for a long time. Um, there's lots of Me Too products coming to market. And industry as a whole has actually failed to agree on what a test method can be to actually define what a galvanic anode is. So I'm going to go away, I'm going to get some aluminium foil, I'm going to roll it up, stick a cable on it, vacuum pack it, make myself a nice data sheet, and I'm going to start selling gym anodes. And <laughs> I'm going to sell them cheaper than anybody else sells galvanic anodes. And I reckon I could sell some. I reckon I really could. Um, so we need to get a grip of that. We need to sort of get some basic test standards to say, well, what does a galvanic anode look like for concrete? And I, I'm going to come back to that later. One of the things we get asked um, quite frequently is, by structure and as so cathodic protection, does it work? We hear your depolarizations and your thermodynamics and your kinetics, and, and we, we see all the textbooks, but does it work? Does it stop bits of concrete falling off my bridge? Uh, so here's a case study, which is, which is quite an, an interesting answer. It's two identical bridges built parallel. It's two bridges supporting a dual carriageway. This is, uh, again, in the West Midlands. It's, uh, it's over a canal. Birmingham was rumoured to have more miles of canal than Venice. I think, judging by that picture, they're probably more picturesque as well. Uh, we've managed to get the shopping trolleys just out of shot. <laughs> Um, in 1992, the, the, the bridge was built in the late 1960s. By 1992, 
uh, there was quite a lot of corrosion taking place, a lot of spalling delamination, and there was an extensive repairs undertaken to both bridges. The client installed impressed current cathodic protection to one bridge, one of the first local authorities in the UK to use cathodic protection. Um, he was hedging his bets a bit. Um, he, he didn't quite have the money to do both bridges, uh, and, and he wasn't really sure about these new technology they were putting on the motorway down the road. Uh, we had mesh overlay to the, to the crossheads, uh, conductive coatings to the columns, different number of zones according to the height of the, of the structure. Some conventional transformer rectify equipment that sits on the bridge on the top. Uh, simple banana sockets for monitoring. We can switch it off and on. Not need any maintenance for 25 years, that kit. And, and I'll, I'll come back to that point in a minute as well. Really importantly, though, the client has maintained specialists to monitor that system for its life. Not always the same specialist. He's put the work out to tender to make sure he gets a good price for doing it. But he's always made sure that somebody has looked after the structure. On a few occasions, there's been some water damage to the paint systems down the outside edge, and he's got that fixed by abseilers. So the client's taken on that he needs to maintain the system. Uh, but in 2009, he found big bits of concrete under his bridge. He got some abseilers, went to have a look at it, and on the bridge without cathodic protection, that's what it looked like. So some pretty extensive spalling, um, plus delamination in other areas. He did a delamination survey on the bridge with the cathodic protection. And there were no defects. He undertook a, a new program of concrete repair to that bridge and installed cathodic protection. So it's just a nice case study for, for, for clients to say, you know, does it work? Well, well here's a real-life example that we, we can take from our experience of two parallel structures. Maybe it took a bit longer to, to, to need repair than we, we maybe sometimes say. It's about 17 years from when the, the first cathodic protection system was installed. But in truth, he probably left it a bit long before he went back and repaired it. That's what it looks like now. A and we, we designed a very similar system for, for the second bridge to, to the first bridge. Power supply and monitoring equipment. We'll come back on to that. Uh, unlike other <coughs> sectors of cathodic protection, we have lots of anode zones and lots of reference electrodes in our concrete structure. Uh, and since the early days of using impressed current, we, we've identified the benefit of using remote monitoring. First system I was involved with was in 1993 at Runcorn in the UK. We took some conventional equipment like we just saw on the, on the last slide, added a data logger, got some motorized potentiometers, off we went. It was great. Worked for many years, <coughs> but y you knew there was a but. This is how we got the data out of it. In 1993, we were using Lotus 1, 2, 3. There was nothing else. It was the thing. It was the future. We were always going to use Lotus 1, 2, 3. Uh, we can't get that anymore. Um, and, and for many years, the, 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 the operator of the Catholic Protection System on that bridge had to have a DOS laptop in his desk drawer just so he can monitor that cathodic protection system. Um, and he had lots of laptops because he had lots of cathodic protection systems from different suppliers. <laughs> um, he, he subsequently replaced it with new equipment uh, for, from Paul's company. Uh, so he's got some standardization across, across the board. Um, but the weakest link in that system happened to be that. Many suppliers have entered and left the market. In my experience, the most common cause of failure of impressed current cathodic protection systems is the power supplies pack up. And there's many reasons why they pack up. When I plug my laptop in, I don't expect the power supply on my laptop to last me more than two years before I have to get onto eBay and buy a new one. Um, so I wouldn't say to a client, I can give them a computer that's going to last 25 years with no maintenance. Components become obsolete, suppliers go out of business. Quite often, they're small companies. One man makes the software. If he leaves the company, you can't get things changed. Um, here's a, an unfortunately poor example, really. This is actually on the hard shoulder of the M1 motorway just coming out of London. Um, we were asked to monitor a system. We couldn't connect to it remotely. Had to get hard shoulder closures, chevrons, cones, fans with lights on. Open the cabinet. The, 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 the computer had been taken out. We subsequently found out it was a touchscreen computer. The screen had failed, so the, guy, the previous guy had taken it out to send back to the manufacturer, only to find the manufacturer got out of business. Um, so the only way to do it is to, is to replace the equipment, because on this system, if you didn't have a PC, you had no CP, so the system on the bridge actually wasn't providing the protection. 
here's another system which was actually 21 years old. This is a same sort of size system, if you like. It's just a couple of zones. And this one, the client's office, is just a few hundred yards down the road over the bridge. It's a local authority. Um, and he wanted us to provide him with a remote monitoring system because everybody else has got one. And we said, no, you, you're fine. Once a month, just have a walk to the bridge and open it up and see if the lights are on. If it is, shut the door and come back the next month. <laughs> it's 21 years old. We've got the settings about right by now. So, you know, we'll come once a year and just check you've got enough protection. You know, don't do anything with it. A lot of our systems now use GSM SIM cards, and they have done since for the last 10, 15 years. But if I ring up Vodafone and say, I'd like a data SIM card, please, but I don't want a 4G one, and I don't want a 3G one, that's several hours of my life I'm spending on the phone, uh, and I'm not going to get a SIM card at the end of it. Um, uh, and another example, we had one big system where all the outstations were linked together back to a central control unit. Um, the central control unit's run by a computer. The computer's plugged into the mains with a little adapter. That failed. Uh, it was a 20 pound component and it stopped a, a big system from working. So it's just some attention to detail to the, to the power supply equipment. N now, I, I am an advocate of remote control and monitoring despite the, the examples I'm giving. There are some big advantages to it. I mean, in the UK, we can put power supplies up, up high to stop the tow rag stealing it and making off with the cabinets. Um, big systems, we've got some big systems we couldn't really effectively operate or, or monitor without a remote monitoring and control system. Uh, we can collect more data, we can collect data over, uh, uh, over with tied data as well to see how that affects our depolarization rather than having a guy sit there all night with a, with a multimeter. We can get systems that send me the data so I haven't got to remember to dial them up and collect the data. So there's lots of good stuff out there. But as a specifier, we, we, we're always thinking now, if I'm designing a system, does it need remote monitoring and control? Am I specifying something that's going to be a weak link? If I do need it, then let's be honest about what the design life is. It's not going to be 25 years for all the components. We haven't got computers and software that have got 25 years design life. We have got simple systems that can give us that sort of life if that's what we need. Um, and we need to make sure if the monitoring system fails, it doesn't actually take out the performance of the quality protection system. It should be there to monitor the system. It shouldn't be there to, to run the system. Uh, and we always specify now that systems must have manual facilities so we can at least come along with a multimeter and see what's going on. We haven't got this issue where if the PC is not there, we can't actually see what's, what's going on. I'm just going to quickly run through the next ones. Uh, another issue we found uh, from our experience down at current density, long-standing guidance is that um, we should limit that to 110 milliamps per square metre. In the 1990s, we started designing um, discrete anode systems in particular at much higher anode current densities. And we're now finding that in, in quite a few instances where that's been done, uh, the backfill to these anodes, which is normally cementitious, is starting to, to acidify or deteriorate. Here's a couple of examples. They're from, from different manufacturers. It's not specific to one particular manufacturer. Uh, and we can see that the grout around the anode is starting to, is, is going yellow and it's starting to come away. We're seeing now on the market uh, discrete anodes which are formed of mesh or different shapes to try and get more current out of effectively the same surface area uh, or of a cylinder. So the effective current density on the backfill mm -hmm. is, is higher even though we're, we're, we're limiting on the anode. We can test the anodes. We don't really see any issues with anodes. We don't see anode failures. Uh, it's a very, very rare thing. Um, the anodes can be proven to last for the, for the life we need. But as designers, we just need to be cautious I in, in what we're designing. Have a think about the backfill materials, the property of it, the depth of cover. Um, uh, and can we, can we maximize the life uh, of the system by reduce the anode current density by having longer anodes or, or, or bigger diameter anodes. Uh, the last part of the first section deals with some really good experience we've had in terms of skills and personnel training. John mentioned it yesterday uh, as a start in his presentation. We've got some great systems out there. We've also seen some which were built fairly, fairly badly. Um, fortunately, th there's, there's less and less of those. In 2006, EN152257, Catholic Protection Competence Levels, was published. It took a few years, really, to, to, for people to take notice of it. 
it covers four sectors. Um, the first one is really pipes, pipelines, marine metallic structures, which covers all sorts of things, onshore and offshore structures, um, tank internals and reinforced concrete. Uh, and technicians have to be certified in individual sectors to work in them, although there are some, some core parts of the courses which cover all of them. It's presently three, three categories. So a level one technician, so the, uh, in the UK, for example, as Chris was saying earlier, the guy who attaches a galvanic anode into a patch repair has to be a level one technician. So he has to know that he has to tie it to the reinforcement and he has to be able to get a multimeter and test the continuity. It's that sort of level of, of, of operative. The level two might be a foreman or, or an inspector. He can prepare the, the, the method statements. He can supervise the other guys doing the work. He can do some measurements. It, it might be an engineer who's worked his way up to level three. He can do reports or, or designs under supervision. And the level three engineer can undertake the detailed designs, interpret the data, and prepare specifications and the like. In the UK, the uh, certification body is the Institute of Corrosion. They prepare the, the, the courses and the syllabuses and the examinations. The Corrosion Prevention Association um, has been at the forefront in reinforced concrete in offering courses to its members for the level one and level two technicians to go, up to, to go on. And it's really been driven by the contractor members of, of that organization who really want their guys to go on it <coughs> because they see the benefit in not having to redo work and be able to offer you know, a better quality of work to their clients. And all the, all the contracting members of the, of the CPA have sent their guys to do these courses. As a result of that, we can also get recognition in the broader skills sector in the UK, the CSCS. Construction Skills Certification Scheme covers everything from digger drivers to, well, to CP technicians now. And so if a guy's got his CP qualification, he can get a standard uh, certificate or a standard <coughs> wallet card uh, that's, that's understood by all the site managers um, throughout the country. Uh, and they wouldn't let a digger driver drive his digger without having the right card. And they now understand that they can't have a guy installing <coughs> anodes on their site who's not got the right car for doing that. And, and that's been a real a benefit as well. So he's got his health and safety training and his certification for his skills on the same card. <coughs> and that's really come about by industry collaboration, the contractors and the consultants and the clients in the industry in the UK, driven by Highways England, actually getting on board and saying, yeah, this is a good thing. This is going to help us all. Um, and it's the contractors who are really funding it because they're the ones paying for the courses and sending the guys on it. That's now going to be superseded by the, the 2017 version, which is an ISO. Um, sorry. Uh, and that's going to be an ISO later this year, and it's going to have five levels of certification, although the, the top and bottom levels are really sort of sandwich the three levels which are there. So the guys which have got the, the certification will carry on. So moving on to a sort of slightly different area, but, but what I think is, I've included really, because I, I think it needs a bit, bit of further study, is quality protection of high strength steels in concrete. And it's really driven by recent experience where we've been asked to look at some structures with high strength steels on, gone away and seen what, what literature's out there, uh, what's available and what we should be doing, and, uh, and scratched our heads a little bit. So, so increasingly, we, we're finding structures maybe pre-stressed or post-tension steel in. Um, and, and there's concerns about hydrogen-induced stress cracking if we apply component protection to these structures. Now, our standard only makes one reference to it, which is, OK, you have to proceed with caution. Uh, but as long as your potential is more negative than minus 900 millivolts, crack on. I, is it as simple as that? Th this, this criteria is based on the fact that if you've got a high pH, um, we can't generate hydrogen at a cathode at a more negative potential. We can only generate hydrogen at a more negative potential than minus 900. So we're keeping it positive at minus 900. We shouldn't have a problem with hydrogen evolution, so we shouldn't have a problem with embrittlement. The first question is, what's a high-strength steel? Is a high-yield reinforcing bar, is that a high-strength steel? Uh, is a post-tension bar a high-strength steel? Is a, I, there's all sorts of things. What is a high-strength steel? It's not defined in our standard. At what point do I need to become concerned that, that this may be an issue for me? Other standards, this is the general principles of seawater. That defines a high strength steel as having a, a specified minimum yield strength greater than 550 newts per millimeter squared. 
the previous version of that standard had a much bigger number of, uh, in terms of uh, sp specified minimum yield strength. Some of the standards define it by hardness uh, in terms of, of, of trying to align that to strength. So what is a high strength steel? It's often considered that if we're doing an atmospheric reinforced concrete structure, we're not going to get a potential more negative than minus 900, so maybe there isn't an issue. But, but we know that if corrosion is initiated um, in those corrosion sites, the pH might be a lot less. So do we have an issue that we can generate hydrogen in those cases at less negative potentials? If corrosion has taken place, have we actually got a higher stress in our bar than we, we would otherwise have, in which case are we making that more susceptible to, to cracking if hydrogen evolves? What about carbonated structures? What about our marine structure where we've got a crack that goes through, um, through the cover concrete to our bar? What's the pH in that environment? S very quickly, some, some, some examples we were asked to look at. The first one was a, was a bridge built in the 1970s. Um, it was structurally deficient when it was built, and they quickly put in these strengthening bars to, to help it out. A and in the midst of time, exactly what those bars are and what they're stressed to and, and what, their, what their composition has got lost. You know, it's a bit sketchy. We've got an idea from some records what they might have been. Um, we wanted to, to provide corrosion protection and catholic protection to the reinforcement on the soffit. That involved drilling long discrete anodes past these bars, so it's a concern that we may get these bars to too negative a potential. And the only way to, to see what was actually going on was to install a full-scale site trial, install anodes, install reference electrodes as deep as we can next to where the bars were. Um, and slowly switch the system on incrementally and make sure that the potentials we were measuring weren't getting anywhere close to where we thought we may have a problem. In addition, making the additional chloride tests and things and making sure that there, there was no risk that that, that high tensile bar could have corroded in any way before we started. Here's another example. Before, before <coughs> they called the corrosion guys, the structural engineers put in these um, high tensile martinistic nickel chrome alloy stainless steel. I don't know why they use stainless steel. I think it's just the bit that sticks out the concrete doesn't corrode. Um, but it, this is more susceptible to HIC than a conventional steel would have been. Uh, subsequently, they wanted to do concrete repairs and install catholic protection to the structure. Could we do it? Is it at risk of, of, of HIC? Uh, we had a third-party modeling organization look at it do potential models from where we look, where we're going to apply the anodes to see what the potentials would be on the bars, and then a program of laboratory analysis to actually work out what the susceptibility of those bars is at those potentials. Uh, and another case we looked at was a marine structure. We've got ties in the structure, high yield strength, um, partly immersed. It's protected by galvanic anodes in the sea, so we expect the potential to be more negative than minus 900. Um, so this was done by an extensive program of lab tests, including some full-scale tests of, of mocking up uh, full-scale anchorages, stressing them to the actual site limits to determine how they reacted under loading with catholic protection attached and defects drilled in to, to simulate defects in the concrete. It's a typical setup for lab testing. The labs are geared up to do HIC testing. You know, they, they know what to do, but if you ask them to do it, they'll come back with a, with a list of questions and say, okay, so what about these parameters? What test solution do you want? Ooh, I don't know. Have you not tested one in concrete before? No, we've not done that. What load do you want? Do you want an incremental load? Do you want a cyclical load? Do you want it pre-charged with hydrogen or not pre-charged with hydrogen? Or we want it to be representative, but we don't want it to be, you know, too conservative or not too conservative. Do you want us to notch the bars to replicate whether the fact that, you know, your, your, your corrosion may have taken place already? What potential limits do you want? Do you want several potential limits checked? Do you want factors of safety in those potential limits? How long do you want this to test for? How long do you normally test for? 30 days. How long is the site? Longer the better. Well, okay. <laughs> uh, th there's lots of questions which, which kind of arose out of the work we looked at. Um, more and more of these structures are going to need intervention. We're going to need to apply complete protection to these structures. Um, it, it can be done, but you need particular testing and attention to detail design. We need to define how we should be testing these 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 bars to see what susceptibility is, um, and we need better guidance in the in the standards for people to, who are who, who practice in this to, to at least identify when they should flag up a problem. What is a high strength bar where you may have an issue? Um, assessment of the steel, fail safe loading, 
fail safe potentials, we want to make sure that our, our power supply, once we've done all this and you saw the cathodic projection, isn't suddenly going to go to a maximum current output and zoom up the current to a limit where, where we, we're going to, you know, generate very negative potentials. So I, I'm just flagging up more questions than answers on these slides, but it's just from our experience. Um, you might be, the answers are out there. If they are, please let me know what they are. Um, but in terms of general industry guidance for applying cathodic protection, um, it's not in our standards at the moment. Uh, moving on to the last thread of this paper is, is galvanic anodes. Uh, and uh, I'm going to start just looking at the design of galvanic anodes for reinforced concrete. When we use, we use galvanic anodes a lot. We use galvanic anodes to protect pipes from the ground. We use galvanic anodes to protect steel piles. Uh, and increasingly on reinforced concrete structures, we're using galvanic anodes. We're, we're applying them on, on the surface of concrete. Or typically, we're drilling holes and installing them in holes in the concrete. When I design my galvanic anodes for, for say, a sheet pile wall, I get the textbook off my shelf. It's got the design equations in there. Off I go. Uh, and the first thing I do is say, I'm designing to protect this sheet pile in the sea. What level of protection do I need? I will say, minus 900 millivolts to, to silver chloride reference electrode. Great. Then I'll say, well, which of these systems is the best to get me to that level of protection? Um, it might be an impressed current system. It might be a galvanic anode system. Sometimes, if it's in brackish waters, I might say, I can't use galvanic anodes. The resistivity is too high. I'm going to have to use uh, impressed current to make sure I can get to that level of protection. In my reinforced concrete textbook on the shelf, it doesn't tell me how to design for galvanic anodes. Nobody's written that bit yet. If I'm designing an impressed current CP system, okay, I know what to do. I calculate the steel, I apply current density, um, work out where to put my anodes, what sort of anodes to use. For galvanic anode designs, I get my manufacturer's data sheet. Um, that tells me how far apart to put them. And it says if you've got lots of steel in them, put them a bit closer together. So off I go, I do a drawing and I put some dots on it, go and build that. But I don't know the anode output. I don't know the protection current density. I don't know what level of protection I'm going to achieve. Is that a design? F for me, it's not. That's not a, that's not a cathodic protection design. So just for fun, one day in the office, my colleague Ian set about doing some calculations. I said, what if we were to design this using the, the big book over here that I use for designing uh, galvanic anodes for things in the ground? So we took an example and we said, well, let's take 10 anodes, a string of 10 galvanic anodes that you might put in concrete. Let's just crib one off a manufacturer's data sheet. Let's say they're 30 mil diameter by 45 mil long anodes. We know we need the concrete resistivity in order to start working out these equations. And we know resistivity concrete can vary a great deal across a structure even. We picked two values. We, we picked 40,000 ohm centimeters because we've got field data of corroding reinforcement and adjacent to it, that's the resistivity of the concrete. So I know I can get corroding reinforcement at that, at that resistivity. Um, but I know at, at lower resistivities, if my, if my structure is partially submerged or immersed, my resistivity might be a lot lower. So we picked a lower value as well, just to see what happened. So we started off with one of Dwight's equations. There's a whole raft of Dwight's equations. Um, they're not perfect. And in this example, we're using a very shallow anode. It's not a true resistance to earth or remote earth, um, but all of that's going to make this, this calculation a little bit, uh, well, work in the favour of this calculation, really. So we plug all our numbers into this equation, and we get a, a resistance for our two different resistivities, 278 and 70. What we do with that resistance is we take a much simpler equation, Ohm's law, and we can work out the current output for each of those strings of anodes um, at the two different resistivities. We have to determine what the driving voltage is, Normally that's simple because it's our protection potential, uh, the difference between our protection potential and the potential of our zinc in, in seawater, so it might be 150 millivolts. Now we're not expecting to protect reinforced concrete or reinforcement in concrete up to something like minus 900 millivolts, but if it's corroding we might want to shift it 100 millivolts, so let's say we're trying to get it to minus 400 millivolts, that gives us a 650 millivolt driving voltage, so we're giving these anodes a, a fighting chance. 
obviously if we've got uh, a higher resistivity, we get less output. So what sort of cathode current densities would those give us? Uh, if we've got 10 anodes and there are a typical spacing of 355 millimetres, that's 1.26 metres squared of steel we're looking to protect. If we say a simple one-to-one -one steel concrete ratio. So at 40,000 ohm centimetres, we're getting a cathode current density of 1.9 milliamps a square metre. And our standard says that if we're getting between 0.2 and 2, we're getting cathodic prevention for, for steel that's not yet corroding. So we're achieving that. We can do that with galvanic anodes. And if we've got a low resistivity, then we can do a bit better than that. We might be getting close to meeting a, a cathodic protection criteria. S so that seems quite interesting. We went out to a site quickly and just collected some data to see if we were somewhere in the right ballpark. Uh, and, and this was just a couple of data sets from when the anodes were first connected. So it's, it's there it's when they're given their most output. On a dry car park slab, we, we got 0.4 milliamps per square metre. On a, on a fairly damp retaining wall, we got 3.5 milliamps per square metre. So we thought, well, we're kind of in the right ballpark. We've probably been a bit generous. The next thing we do if we're designing a galvanic anode is we want to know how long it's going to last. That's a relatively straightforward equation. The one unknown in this is we have to work out the utilisation factor. So at what point does that anode actually stop working? When it's 50% consumed, will it carry on working? At what point will it kind of fall apart and not deliver current anymore? There is no data at all for galvanic anodes in concrete. Do they, do they last for 85%, which is normal for a galvanic anode in the sea or the ground, or is it less than that? Because they've only got a small wire tie that attaches the zinc to, to, the, to the reinforcement. Uh, we know what the weight of, of the anodes are. We know what the anode capacity is. So we picked two utilisation factors just to, to compare it. A, a, a fairly standard 0.85, but we think that might be generous. What if it's less? So if we compare it to our cathode current densities, well, our, our 40,000 ohm centimetre concrete, we're not getting much current, but it's going to last a reasonable amount of time. Our 10,000 ohm resistivity concrete, we're getting a, a, a better current density, but seven years. And we flag this up because really these basic considerations for galvanic anodes, they're often not stated, you know, it's maybe not clear to, to, a, to a purchaser or a client what it is they're getting. For sure, they're going to do some good, uh, but the benefit or the extent of that um, really needs to be determined. <coughs> if we need a high current density, if we need to achieve cathodic protection, we're not going to do it with galvanic anodes. Um, if the resistivity is very low, then we might get close to doing it, in which case the life of those anodes is going to be low. So that's the design. I, I'll, I'll come back quickly to, to, to my gym anode, because I'm, I'm going to make a fortune out of these. <laughs> <laughs> Best practice guidance we use in the UK, Technical Report 73, that's got a model specification. That gives us three criteria that a galvanic anode is going to meet. If you hit those three bullet points, Go and sell it. Um, it shall have proven technical merit. Well, it's, it's, it's more anodic than steel, so my aluminium foil is looking good. Uh, it shan't present a corrosion risk to the steel at the end of the service life. It's definitely not going to do that. Uh, and the consumption of a galvanic anode should not give rise to expansive forces in the cover. Well, I'm not going to wrap it very tight, so there'll be some gaps between the, the leaves of foil, so I'm <laughs> going to be okay. Uh, it's going to be good. And the brochure looks good, too. Uh, oh, I'm coming back to this point. We need to define the test methods. We need to define, as an industry, as a cathodic protection industry, we need to define the test methods for these products. And we can't leave it to the manufacturers because they can't agree. We've, we've left it to the manufacturers in the UK for a few years, tried to get them together. They've not come to the party, so it's going to be other, other people. It's going to be the designers and specifiers who get this thing together. And finally, once we've got our anodes, once I've got my anode in the structure, you know, I'm going to prove to everybody that it works. If, it doesn't, uh, if you can't monitor it, it doesn't meet the standard. That's, that's the end of story. The, the standard says, though, if you do monitor it and it doesn't meet our 100 millivolt decay, or it's not minus 720 millivolts, we can actually assess the corrosion rate, really to assess the, the risk of corrosion on our structure. Now, that's not a performance criteria. That's saying if your 
CP system fails to meet the performance criteria, as a last resort, you can check and see if your structure is corroding. So for me, a system that meets this criteria has, has failed the public protection criteria. I'm only, I'm only going out and checking this if, if, if I'm proving I don't have catholic protection. And the ISO standard recommends using the, the Butler-Volmer formula. That's fine, and, and we have to go and measure, we have to work out what I-core is, and to do that we need to know the applied current density, so we need to go to site and do that. Now that's not actually that easy when you get to try and do it, because you have to measure a current, and then you have to measure the current density, because you need to have the steel surface which you're, you're trying to protect. I, I'm understating it when I say it's not straightforward, at least from my experience. Quite a lot of systems are not designed to be isolated, so we just can't measure the current. We can't measure a potential shift. Um, we can't really come to any conclusion on what the corrosion rate is. Measuring small currents with handheld meters. Well, I'm on my step ladder because I've put the box out of, uh, out of reach so the, so the kids can't pull it off the wall. So I'm on the step ladder and I've got my multimeter and somebody's connected the wires in the terminal, the anode to the cathode. So I need to disconnect that and put my meter in series. So I've disconnected it and, well, I've disconnected it now, haven't I? So what's the current, what current, what current was it given? It, it's just, it's gonna be different now. When I, so I reconnect my meter in series, then I've got three, three buttons on my meter for different series, you know, for different scales from my meters, and I press each one and I get a different number because I've got a shunt in my meter and it's got a different resistor in it and I can get an order of magnitude different current from my handheld multimeter, but the, 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 the book doesn't tell me what instrument to use. Uh, and then I've got it, I need to work out what the current density is, so I need to know what steel area these anodes are protecting. Have I got the reinforcement drawing? I don't know what the reinforcement drawing is anymore. And if I do know it, I don't know if there's a link in or a lap in the steel where my anodes are. And I don't know how far the current distribution from these anodes is going. It could be a, out by order of magnitude of two or five. Axton Buchler, uh, a couple of years ago, tried to recreate some laboratory experiments as well. Th they've identified significant variations in the data depending where you put the reference electrode. Uh, They've also identified errors in the standard formula, uh, which they're looking at further. But we do need performance data on galvanic anodes. So I'm, I'm being kind of critical of that particular clause of, of the ISO standard, because um, I'm not really sure if it's helping us find out if galvanic anodes work by trying to determine if our structures are at risk of corrosion. We do need performance data on, on, on galvanic anodes. There is a lack of it. Options for monitoring may be, well, design all systems of anodes can all be disconnected, include monitoring segments, that was mentioned yesterday, surface potential mapping, well, I'm not sure because it doesn't give me any indication of what the current is or what the life may be, or maybe coupons, so maybe I can disconnect a, a piece of steel from the, uh, put a piece of steel in that I can disconnect rather than disconnecting the anodes. Um, so, so, so there's some work to be done there, you know, in terms of developing this as a technology. Uh, as an industry, we need to give some, some advice to, 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 to everybody about that. Uh, so just to conclude, <coughs> there's a long track record of, of impressed current cathodic protection. Uh, over 25 years, it's a mature engineering solution. There's standards that tell us how to do it. But we know the things which the standards don't tell us from our experience. We know what the most common cause of failure is, and we know what we can do to help alleviate that. Uh, we know practically some issues with acidification of, of backfill, and others have spoken to me in the last day or two about some other issues they've seen uh, here as well, using different types of anode systems. Um, but we can control that with the design. Competence certification staff, brilliant, really good. You know, it's a real plus point for our industry in the UK. It's really helped things come along. It's really helped clients accept the technology, really improve skills and standards. Um, and the new ISO standard, if, if, if you haven't got equivalent schemes here in, in Australia, it, it, it's worked wonders for us. Increasingly, we're finding structures with high strength steels. Um, we can apply CP safely to it, but generally, as it becomes a more everyday thing to be done, better guidance is going to be needed. Galvanic anodes are frequently used to, to prevent incipient anode formation. Uh, increasingly, they're being used to provide global protection. They're not currently subject to a rigorous design. Resistivity has a significant um, impact on the output you get from the, from the anodes. 
how you assess performance needs review. We need to get some standardisation on that. Um, and the corrosion rate assessment for, for steel and concrete in the ISO standard is, based on my personal experience, difficult to use um, and other people's work has, has maybe identified flaws in that as well. Uh, and we need to give our clients better guidance on what they're getting when they're getting the galvanic anode system because I, I don't really want them to get a gym anode in their, in their bridge. Thank you.